Alexander Solzhenitsyn was a teacher at our school. He's a famous writer and author of many works, including The Gulag Archipelago, Matriona's House, The First Circle, and The Cancer Ward. Alexander Solzhenitsyn received the Nobel Prize for Literature. During the Soviet era, he was accused of heresy. Following his rehabilitation, he worked as a physics and astronomy teacher at our school from 1957 to 1962. Solzhenitsyn came to visit us in 1994. This is a photo of him in front of this notice board. We have a signed copy of one of his books. I cannot live without the language and I live in the language, it's obvious. The richness of Russian words and expressions, the language's unconstrained syntax afford me intense pleasure. And so they take you away. During a daylight arrest, there's always that brief and unique moment when they take you through a crowd of hundreds of just such doomed innocent people as yourself. Well, you aren't gagged. You can and you really should cry out cry out that you're being arrested. On the 11th day after my arrest, three smirsh bums burdened by four suitcases full of war booty. I myself lugged a fifth suitcase with no great joy since it contained my diaries and literary works, which were being used as evidence against me. They brought me to the Belarusian station in Moscow. Not one of the three knew the city, and it was up to me to pick the shortest route to prison. And now I was leading the Smirchman through the concourse of the subway station, with its brilliant electric lights, and opposite us, two parallel escalators, thickly packed with Muscovites, rising from below. It seemed as though they were all looking at me. They kept coming in endless ribbons from down there, from the depths of ignorance, on and on, reaching toward me, or at least one word of truth. So why did I keep silent? I kept silent for only one reason. These Muscovites thronging the steps of the escalators were not enough for me. Here my cry would be heard by 200 or twice 200. But what about 200 million? Vaguely and clearly I had a vision that someday I would cry out to the 200 million. But for the time being, I did not open my mouth, and the escalator dragged me implacably down into the netherworld. In February 1945, Captain Solzhenitsyn's life was turned upside down. He was arrested on the front. There were thousands like him, but he was the only one who knew in his heart of hearts that the writer he had always wished to be had just been born. <laughs> Packed into those cells, starving, always standing, I was transported by the accounts of these people, truly transported. I listen to them with joy, with delight, since nowhere else does one hear such things. It's a dense experience, truly dense. It entered my life, it caught me like this. I didn't need to go looking for it. I didn't need to descend into the depths of my own soul. Even though I had already come back to God, prison life changed me completely. I examined my life and I was deeply moved. With all the intelligence in the world, I could not have invented my own life better than it invented itself. Everything in it presented itself to me. All I had to do was take possession of it and write about it. It was a genuine act of fate. Even today, I see it this way. I feel it every day. Alexander Solzhenitsyn was born on December 11, 1918, in Klitsovsk in southern Russia. This is his father, Izaki. He was still a student when he volunteered for the army in 1914. Here is his mother, Tessia, his wife, Natalia Svetlova's second wife, mother of his three children. Alexander's album, Childhood, Adolescence, Front, Prison, Camps. His parents, here is his mother, were married at the front in the summer of 1918. 
His father died as a result of a hunting accident before he was born. Despite his mother's high level of education, she was forced to accept a very ordinary job as a typist and stenographer due to her privileged social origin. His first photo. Here he is aged six. He remembers helping his mother bury the decorations his father won at the front. Owning them was a crime. Alexander, Sanya to his family and friends, was a good pupil, a passionate reader. At 10, he devoured War and Peace. Rostov University, the Karl Marx Library, where he spent much time with his friends, the mathematics and physics department where he was enrolled. No. I had to study at school, but also at the mathematics and physics department because it was extremely dangerous to study literature in the Soviet era. It could land you in serious trouble. Furthermore, Rostov on the Don is a small southern town quite different from central Russia. The Russian spoken there is not very good. There are no Russian landscapes. I discovered all that for the first time in 1939 at the age of 21. That's when I began to realize what I had been deprived of. Still during his studies, Natalia Reshetovskaya, his fiancée, and other friends, Nikolai Vitkevich, Koka, his great friend. He loved Brahms, the theater. He wrote nothing serious, according to him, even though he had started a historical novel. He married in 1940. He and his wife obtained their first teaching posts. Then the war came. He was called up in 1941. He served as a military transport driver in a Cossack unit and later became a commander of an artillery battery. In a letter to his wife, he wrote, it is impossible to become a great Russian writer without having been at the front. He kept a diary. Here, is he writing or calculating the position of German artillery? It's hard to say. He was an officer in the Red Army, sure of himself, his rights, and his convictions. You see, in the hostile and atheist climate of the Soviet era, I had a strictly religious upbringing. And I defended this right. I fought for this right. Afterwards, I was forced to hide my convictions since, for example, people had discovered that I went to church. At school, the crucifix I wore was torn from my neck. It was a way of saying, look at him, he's the enemy. And yet I coped with this difficult period at school. But towards the end of school, when I was 17 or thereabouts, they began to teach us about dialectic, historical materialism. And I was totally captivated, completely won over. And I became an atheist and a Marxist. However, I did not immediately realize what this actually involved. I was to discover this much later. First, I went off to the front, and even there, at least initially, I thought along these lines. And paradoxically, it was his faith in Marxism that led to his arrest in 1945. The letters he wrote to his friend Koka from the front were intercepted. I knew that it was forbidden to disclose military secrets in letters, but I thought we were allowed to think, and so I indulged openly in derogatory comments about Stalin, although I did not refer to him by name. I had been critical of him for many years. In my opinion, he had strayed from Leninism, he was responsible for the defeats of the first half of the war, and he was a mere theoretician who expressed himself in a vulgar fashion. Moscow. Lubyanka, the prison of terror. Solzhenitsyn was incarcerated there. I distinguished the clear signs that the instruction was drawing to an end. All the notebooks of my war diary were cast into the hellish maw of the Lubyanka furnace. These diaries constituted my claim to become a writer until the instant where the red pyre of one more novel, which had perished in Russia, flew out of the window in black butterflies of soot. Oh, how many ideas and works had perished in that building. A whole lost culture. Oh, suit, suit, from the Ludbianka chimneys. Solzhenitsyn was sentenced to eight years in a corrective labor camp for anti-revolutionary activities. Under Article 58, he was 27. The camps were often located in disused monasteries. He discovered the manual labor and the harsh environment of the gulag. 
three times a day that same black, unsalted infusion of nettle leaves, and once a day a ladle of thin gruel, a third of a liter. And the bread had already been sliced. They gave 15 and a quarter ounces in the morning, and not a crumb more during the day or evening. We slept on bare bunks in wet clothes, muddied with clay, and we shivered because they weren't heating the barracks. A short distance from the New Jerusalem Monastery lay a brick factory, which had been turned into a KGB-controlled labor camp where common criminals were imprisoned with political prisoners. A fellow inmate recalls those times. Uh, well, Solzhenitsyn made bricks. We had no idea who he was, that he was a writer, a poet. It was only afterwards, when everything came to light, that we learned Solzhenitsyn had served his sentence as an enemy of the people in our factory. And that's when we knew who he was. Such is a man's nature that even bitter, detested work is sometimes performed with an incomprehensible, wild excitement. I encountered this strange phenomenon myself. Suddenly you become absorbed in the work itself irrespective of whether it's slave labor and offers you nothing. I experienced those strange moments at bricklaying, at foundry work, at carpentry. Solzhenitsyn was saved from this backbreaking work thanks to his aptitude for mathematics. In 1947, he was transferred to a Sharashaka, or prison research institute in Mavrino, near Moscow. He is 30 years old in this photo. The jacket and tie were lent to him by the administration for the occasion. The object of his research was acoustics, as he described in the first circle, deciphering the human voice in order to identify a man by his voice print. Two years in a warm and clean environment, decently fed but constantly watched, 12 hours a day at a desk, obliged to please the authorities. His favorite reading matter was the dictionary and Tolstoy, but his stay in the gilded prison came to an end. I shouldn't worry about leaving if I were you. We bust our guts for 20 grams of fat a day. It's better to have water and bread than cake and trouble. 1950, departure for distant Kazakhstan to one of the special camps set up by Stalin for political prisoners. Where are they going? They're never told. What can Zek the prisoner expect in the new place? The copper mines? A lumber camp? Or would it be detailed to farm work where you can eat your fill of turnips? Maybe he'll never even get there. Will he die of dysentery in his cattle truck? Or die of hunger because the train doesn't stop for six days and no rations are issued? Or will his guard club him to death with his rifle butt for attempted escape? Or at the end of the journey, will they throw the prisoners' frozen corpses out of an unheated wagon like so many logs of wood? At the Gulag, he managed to avoid working as a general laborer. The chances for survival were greater. Like him of whom the poet sings, a mason, I tame the wild stones to make a jail. No city jail here, not but fences, huts and guard towers meets the eye. And in the limpid sky, the watchful buzzard sail. None but the wind moves on the step, none to inquire for whom I raise these walls. Why dogs, machine guns, why are still not jail enough? Back on our perch we peer into cells walled with stones, black pits whose depths will muffle tortured comrades' groans. Oh God, how lost we are, how impotent was ever slave more abject. It was tough physical work, but with his mind free cleansed, he found the strength to compose verse in his head or on a scrap of paper that he would destroy once he had learned it by heart. The memory was the only hidey hole in which you could keep what you had written. In the early days, I had little confidence in the powers of memory and decided, therefore, to write in verse. I composed over 8,000. Once a month, I recited all that I had written with the aid of a rosary made of bread that the Catholic prisoners had helped me put together. January 1952, his camp rebelled. His tumor, already detected, suddenly grew bigger. It was cancerous. He was operated on by a fellow inmate and surgeon in the camp hospital, where he discovered the horrifying manner in which the uprising had been quelled. I was lying in the hospital among those wounded and maimed on the bloody night. There were men beaten by the warders to a bloody pulp. 
They had nothing left to lie on. Their flesh was in ribbons. One burly warder had been particularly brutal with his length of iron piping. One man had already died of his wounds. This was a hunger strike called not by well-fed people with reserves of subcutaneous fat, but by gaunt, emaciated men who had felt the whip of hunger daily for years on end. Following this terrible episode, his eight-year sentence completed, Solzhenitsyn was released from the camp, but was sent into perpetual exile in another part of Kazakhstan. Pose in gulag clothes. Once he had left the camp, he had himself photographed. The numbers are genuine. He had them smuggled out of the camp. March 5th, 1953. I went out to listen to the news being broadcast from the loudspeaker. This was the moment we'd all looked forward to, the moment for which every Zek in Gulag had prayed. He's dead, the Asiatic dictator is dead. The villain has curled up and died. What unconcealed rejoicing there would be back home in the special camp. But where I was, Russian girls stood sobbing their hearts out. What is to become of us now? I could have howled with joy there by the loudspeaker. I could have danced a wild jig. Autumn 1953, he had a relapse. Diagnosis, three weeks left to live. All that I had memorized in the camps ran the risk of extinction together with the head that held it. Death on the threshold of liberation. He was treated at the cancer clinic in Tashkent, an ordeal described in Cancer Ward. A few months later, he returned, cured, to Kokterek, his place of enforced exile. He was able to earn a living. Meanwhile, his wife had asked for a divorce. And my two years of truly beautiful exile began, with only one sacrifice to cast a shadow. I dared not marry. I ordered a firm table to ride on, but it went on sleeping on the same old bare wooden boxes. I also bought a shortwave radio set to catch some of the forbidden news and a camera, and I photographed myself. Shall I describe the happiness it gave me to go into the classroom and pick up the chalk? This was really the day of my release, the restoration of my citizenship. And every day, I had a little time left for writing. As soon as I sat down, the lines raised from under my pen. It appeared that I must learn to make hidey holes where my papers would be safe from the perfunctory inspections to which exiles were subjected. I began to microfilm my manuscripts and fit them into the covers of books or bury them in bottles. February 1956, the 20th Congress of the Soviet Communist Party. Khrushchev delivered his secret speech about Stalin's crimes. It shook the communist world. This was a decisive Congress for the exiled Solzhenitsyn, who was rehabilitated in April of the same year. He was able to return to Russia. After the steppes of Central Asia, the countryside, the landscapes, the woods and fields of his cherished homeland aroused in him feelings of unparalleled joy. His rehabilitation was not easy. He eventually found a teaching post in Torfu Product, an isolated village east of Moscow. He lodged with a local woman named Matryona, the heroine of his subsequent story of the same name. The following year, he renewed ties with his first wife. Their divorce was canceled and went to join her in Riazan, where she lived. The former Zek found a teaching post. The truth always comes out. We knew he came from over there. He arrived here in a pitiful state. His first wife was here to welcome him, and he settled here. We often met in the courtyard where he worked, where he wrote. He really liked this neglected courtyard. That's where he put his desk. He made it himself out of apple tree trunks. He made a desk as well as a little bench attached to it. He would sit there writing, keeping himself to himself. He would get up very early, around four in the morning. He only ever wrote in the morning. 
And when everybody left for work, he would leave for school. He taught mathematics and physics at school number two. Nobody had even the slightest idea about what he was writing. He completed the first circle at this time. He was a very honest, very honorable, very good man. He got on extremely well with the other teachers and pupils. The pupils loved him. He took an active part in school life, and all the pupils eagerly participated in his photo club. For Solzhenitsyn, sitting down on paper, everything he had experienced in the Gulag was a matter of priority. He never went to bed without checking everything was hidden and rehearsing his behavior in case there was a knock in the night. One fine day, an account emerged. Let's take a day in the life of Ivan Denisovich. Where did I get the idea? It was after a tough day at camp. I'd been working hard transporting bars with my teammate. And I was wondering how to convey this world of the camps. You could either describe ten years of camp life or the entire history of the camps. But, in fact, all you have to do is gather it all together in one day, the entire camp in a drop of water. It suffices to describe one day in the life of an ordinary man from morning to night. You would have everything. This idea came to me in 1952. Yes, I was still in the camp at that time. Obviously, it was a crazy idea. And then the years went by. I wrote a number of novels. I had cancer. I was on the verge of death. And then, when was it now? One day in, in 1959, I said to myself, I think I can now formulate this idea. The idea had remained with me for seven years. What if I described the day of a political prisoner? I set to work, it poured out with a terrible feeling of tension. Within me there was a mass of days, many days like these. I stuck at it through fear of forgetting something. I wrote Ivan Denisovich very quickly, but I didn't dare tell anyone. Novi Mir in Moscow, leading literary journal and official organ of the Union of Soviet Writers. Its editor was Alexander Trydovsky, a highly acclaimed and courageous poet. In front of the editorial board, he spoke out in favor of the anti-Stalinist line taken by Khrushchev at the 20th Party Congress. This is what convinced Solzhenitsyn to reveal his work. This man, this teacher from Ryazan, a complete unknown who well, rather than coming here himself, mailed his account to the editorial board of the country's most famous literary journal. And it was his account of the gulag, of the camps. At the time he sent us the manuscript, this kind of thing that he was writing about had never ever been discussed before in any legally published novel, account or poem in the Soviet Union. One wonders how this man could have thought his text was publishable. And yet he did send it and the miraculous happened. The text fell into the hands of the country's leader, and he permitted its publication. Once published, the account was read by the entire country, even by those people who don't usually read, and it represented a symbolic event both in the history of Russian literature and in the history of 20th century Russia. In November 1962, Novi Mir published One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. The issue also contained a short story by Hemingway. The book was translated into several languages. It was an international event. The Stalinist Gulag had entered literature. As usual, at five o'clock that morning, reveille was sounded by the blow of a hammer on a length of rail hanging up near the staff quarters. The intermittent sounds barely penetrated the window panes on which the frost lay two fingers thick. Solzhenitsyn was able to devote himself entirely to his literary career. He gave up teaching and traveled all over Russia. Fradvosky imposed the publication of For the Good of the Cause and an incident at Krechetovka Station, despite the increasingly open opposition of the editorial board. It all ended rather sadly, since Solzhenitsyn's other works, notably The First Circle and Cancer Ward, because of their themes, and through their finality, exceeded the boundaries of what the authorities 
deemed acceptable. Indeed, everything did change. Khrushchev was overthrown in 1964. Brezhnev came to power, and with him, the years of darkness. Zakhar the Pouch appeared in Novi Mir in January 1966. It was his last work to be officially published. After just four years, Solzhenitsyn's legal existence as a writer was over. The renowned writer became an underground writer once more. His name was held in contempt, his works were withdrawn from libraries and destroyed. But for the former inmates of the Gulag, he was the man who had dared to speak out, who had broken the silence. Following the publication of Ivan Denisovich, personal testimonies flooded in. An immense collective cry, said Solzhenitsyn. He then embarked on an ambitious project, collecting together all the first-hand accounts of the former Zex. When the police confiscated the manuscripts of the first circle and of two plays at a friend's house and when a little later the Riazan branch of the writers union expelled him a clandestine operation began. Solzhenitsyn organized a veritable network modeled on the resistance movement composed of a host of devoted collaborators in different parts of the country. They met in secret. He was the driving force behind it and was in charge of writing what would later become the Gulag Archipelago. With this monumental work completed and smuggled to the West on microfilm, Solzhenitsyn set out to work on an even more ambitious enterprise, the history of the revolution, the Red Wheel, which opens with August 1914. Solzhenitsyn made increasingly frequent trips to Moscow. In 1968, he became friends with Natalia Zvetlova, a young mathematician who frequented the circle of dissidents. She became his second wife and the mother of his three children. He met Sakharov, the father of the H-bomb, and a leading dissident. They made a number of plans together, but the noose was tightening. The KGB began to hound him relentlessly. He was spied upon, intimidated, tailing, phone tapping, threatening letters, anonymous phone calls. He received the full treatment. There was even plans to assassinate him, to provoke a fatal car accident. They interfered in his private life, but he would not let himself be intimidated. He met foreign correspondents, made statements to the world press, and denounced state censorship. He was still not allowed to reside in Moscow, even though his new family lived there. But he could remain in semi-hiding, very close to the capital, in a dacha lent to him by the cellist Rostopovich. It was here in 1970 that he learned that he'd been awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. An act of provocation, claimed the authorities. He declined to collect it for fear of being unable to return to his homeland. Paradel Kino, the writer's village near Moscow. Solzhenitsyn lived there in Lydia Chukovskaya's dacha. The police got its hands on the Gulag manuscript hidden by the woman who had typed it. My whole life's work had come to grief. And it was not only my life's work, but the dying wishes of millions whose last whisper, last moan had been cut short on some hut floor in some prison camp. I had not carried out the behests. I had betrayed them. The hopes once held in those skulls buried now in common graves in the camps had been set on me. I had collapsed, and their hopes had slipped from my hands. After three days of interrogation, Elizaveta Voronyanskaya revealed the hiding place and on returning home, hanged herself. Paris, the heart of the Latin Quarter, the offices of Imca Press, which had published August 14, two years earlier. Since then, Solzhenitsyn had regularly corresponded with Nikita Struve, the editor in charge of the only surviving publishing house founded by Russian emigres. These little missives here became increasingly frequent. They were brought here in the diplomatic pouch. All the names are in code, mine in particular. My dear Kolya, etc. Everything is written in code. They were extremely compact letters. As always in Solzhenitsyn's letters, different colors were used to draw my attention to a particular point. Such and such a project had its code name, which meant that if the letters ever fell into the wrong hands, and that could happen, the real subject matter of our correspondence, if you like, would not have been discovered immediately. 
And it was at the moment when the manuscript was discovered that Solzhenitsyn gave the go-ahead to publish it as quickly as possible. If I'm not mistaken, it was at the end of October, and we published it at the end of December 1973. Obviously, we tried to be as discreet as possible about the entire business. My wife and I did the proofreading on our own. Only a very limited circle was aware of it. Only four or five people actually knew that we were preparing it for publication. I mean, this was a bomb which would soon explode all over the world. It was the literary event of, I'd say, the second half of the 20th century. On the 28th of December, listening as usual to the BBC while I had my afternoon snack, I heard the unexpected news that the first volume of Gulag had come out in Russian in Paris. I was expecting it to be published on January 7th, the Orthodox Christmas. I heard the news calmly and continued forking cabbage into my mouth. What a burden I had shed secretly, surreptitiously I'd carried it and had brought it safely to its destination. And now it was no longer on my back, but set where all could see it that unwieldy stone, that great petrified tear. It was here that he wrote his promotional articles of that time, his articles against censorship. He tried to rally Soviet writers to the cause, to the fight against censorship. It was also here that he worked on the fragments of what would become the Red Wheel. Undoubtedly, it was here that he communed with nature for the last time, with these pine trees, because he felt he was being watched, and he knew that he might be arrested. That's why he hid everything very carefully. Tchaikovsky had even suggested that he use an old stump, which is over there somewhere, as a hiding place. But for Solzhenitsyn, the very experienced conspirator, it was too obvious of a place and he decided against it. Also, there were more and more signs that disaster was impending. The very last time he went into town, he was arrested the next day and sent into exile. These pine trees were the last he saw in Russia before he was expelled. The writer and his wife had been preparing themselves for his arrest for months and had agreed on a plan of action. And yet, at 5 o'clock in the evening on February 7th, 1974, there was a ring at Mrs. Solzhenitsyn's door. Two men stood outside, six others lay in wait. She called her husband. He came to open the door. It was too late. A foot in the door, they barged in. They had a warrant. It took two cars and eight men to arrest and exile the dissident, of whom the authorities were so afraid that they even deleted the word archipelago from the dictionary. A plane took him in handcuffs to Germany. He was the only passenger in first class. Supported by the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet, the decision to expel him had been taken by the Politburo by Brezhnev in person. In Frankfurt, he was met by the writer Heinrich Boll, and he declared to a very disappointed world press that he intended to keep silent for the time being. He settled in Zurich. His wife, children, and mother-in-law were permitted to join him in a city where he found the traces of Lenin, one of the many characters in the Red Wheel. Lenin is one of the central figures of my saga, and one of the central figures in our history. I've been thinking about his character ever since I first had the idea of writing this saga some, some 40 years ago. I collected everything about him, absolutely everything. As the years went by, I gradually began to understand him. I even went as far as to fill card after card with details of the most minor events in his life so as to understand what character traits became apparent. I catalogued everything I learned about him from his books, his memoirs, as well as the events which brought out this or that character trait. I don't use all of this in my work, but it forms a system in my head. I now feel sufficiently mature to describe Lenin, 
and I'm writing about his years spent in Zurich. Naturally, retrospectively, his past life, private life and party life are all intermingled. I have no other mission but to convey the image of Lenin alive as he was, rejecting all the official accolades and myths. And so his life's work, dreamt of and begun during his youth in an attempt to understand and explain the history of the 1917 revolution, took shape. My generation is the last generation to be able to write about this material as an event which is more or less part of our living memory rather than a part of history. My childhood memories are steeped in the post-revolutionary atmosphere. In the 1920s, everybody came from before the revolution. I can still feel this atmosphere. It helps me to find the appropriate material. I had the idea of creating these knots, designed to result in a dense exposition of events. This method involves finding the critical points in the curve of our history. In mathematics, such points are called nodal points. I consider these nodal points, these knots, in their most dense form. I take 10 or 20 days of continuous narrative. I always choose those points that determine an event, not necessarily an external event, but an internal one, where history is at a turning point. I write about these 20 days in detail, explaining them from all sides. I break off between two knots, which is how the idea of knots was formed. Nineteen seventy six, exile in the United States in Vermont. One day he told his sons, We will fly away on a magic horse to Russia, a life devoted to writing and family. For twenty years he dedicated himself entirely to riding the red wheel. His wife helped him, as always, notably with research. He contacted fellow emigres with a view to founding a library of Russian memory. The material itself indicates how it should be rendered, in cinematic form, in the form of maxims or newspaper clippings, in the form of segments that are apparently unrelated but which contrast with each other. When I was writing The Red Wheel, I had two passions, a literary passion, to penetrate the great names in history, to render them from the inside. They became my close friends. These individuals were not invented, they're part of history. As far as the 20 or 30 most outstanding figures were concerned, I depicted them as my own creatures. I had explored their lives, thought about them so much. On the other hand, I had a responsibility as an historian because I was aware that my red wheel was more than just a simple literary work. I had a responsibility towards this material. It was my duty to ensure it was not lost to history, despite the Bolsheviks' attempts to distort the facts. People had to know about these details I had collected, thanks to the emigres who, who provided me with so many first-hand accounts, with books lost through time. By immersing myself in all this, I came to understand that through its significance, the February Revolution was the root, the source of it all. At the same time, it took so much of my energy that I ran out of inspiration. What else could I write, and who would read more than ten volumes? 1994, The Great Return. Triumphant entry into the country by Vladivostok, followed by a long train journey to Moscow, reunion with the Russian soil, still moved by these landscapes so vividly described in his books, which, after the fall of communism, became widely available and were studied in schools.
Back in Russia, I wrote more miniatures. Strangely enough, they are little fragments of my soul. I had already written some before my expulsion from Russia. Then, when I was abroad, I didn't write a single one. I didn't need to. My soul had closed up. When I returned to Russia, they came back. The morning. What is it that happens to our soul during the night? In the motionless numbness of your sleep, it seems to free itself from the body, to cross pure expanses, to shed all those trivial things which have stuck to it or crushed it during the day for entire years. And it returns in its original pure white form. And this infinite peaceful clear morning state permeates your entire being. What meditation these moments afford. It seems that in this instant, in a state of sudden perceptiveness, you will understand secrets, secrets never understood before. You are in ecstasy, as if an unfamiliar seed, a seed you never suspected in yourself, were beginning to grow within you. Hardly breathing, you summon up this clear shoot, these white lilies on the verge of rising up to the immaculate surface of an endless expanse of water. What a blessing these moments are. You float above yourself. You can uncover incomparable secrets, secrets to contemplate, unravel. Above all, do not move, do not disturb the surface of this lake within you. But soon, inevitably, an event will send ripples across this subtle stretch of water, breaking its surface. Sometimes it's the act of another person, a word. Sometimes it's one of your own small thoughts. And this enchantment vanishes. Instantly, the wonderful stillness is no longer, nor the lake. And all the day through, nothing you can do can bring them back, and they will not be there every morning. Two books of memoirs, a minor genre for Solzhenitsyn, but essential for re-establishing a frequently distorted truth. The Oak and the Calf, his struggle in Soviet Russia, and The Grain Falls Between the Millstones, his vision of the West, as yet unavailable in English. The communist millstone is characterized by its sanguinary, ruthless ferocity. At the same time, I am merely a sort of ineffective particle to it, a tiny grain of sand fallen on the road. Whereas what I got from the Western millstone was characterized by a tendency to crush, by a toxicity peculiar to it, strangely enough, a sort of baseness, of vulgarity, which is not characteristic of the West as a whole, but of all these irresponsible people who write any old thing without first checking the facts. How am I supposed to react when one after another dozens and dozens of journalists repeat the same ideas about me, when not a single one of them has bothered to look at or, or read my books? But they repeat them even so. What mediocrity, what baseness. It's reminiscent of the Soviet way of doing things. Everybody is ordered to say this or that, and so everybody does. It's the same in the West. Here, totalitarian power dictates. Over there, it's fashion. Fashion, this horrible fashion which prevents people from seeing. Since his return to Russia, Solzhenitsyn has traveled to over 26 regions, listening to the voice of its people. I've written four documents on the Russian situation. Letter to the Soviet leaders, 
Rebuilding Russia, the Russian question, and Russia in the abyss. Henceforth, I won't be writing any more major documents on Russia. It's no longer possible at my age. I don't have enough time to see it through. I would love to find a solution, but this would require a vision inaccessible to mortals. Obviously, a solution for Russia exists, but nobody's found it yet. A fairly good solution could have been found following the fall of communism. But the vultures who seized power, not the politicians nor the patriots, but the vultures who seized power decided otherwise. They took a road which leads nowhere. The disaster of communism has been succeeded by the disaster of the so-called free market reforms. There have been no market reforms. There is no democracy in our country. It's the oligarchy of a few bandits and nothing more. Literature that is not the breath of contemporary society, that does not transmit the pains and fears of that society, that does not warn in time against threatening moral and social dangers, such literature does not deserve the name of literature. It is only a facade.